Today in world literature, we turn to the study of contemporary North American short fiction. In this lecture, I turn to selections from the work of James Baldwin, Raymond Carver, Leslie Marmon Silco, and Margaret Atwood. I want to use these authors to demonstrate the diversity and complexity of North American literature. Baldwin depicts an urban world of danger. Carver portrays an America in which faith is lost. Silco writes of a world in which traditional Native American figures operate in a world lost to them. And Atwood gives us characters who struggle to get a handle on multiculturalism. The United States is the fourth largest country in the world, the fourth most populous with 250 million people. Canada has one-tenth of the U.S. population, but 80% of those live within 100 miles of the U.S. border. You might imagine, then, that there are great similarities between these two countries. First of all, there's an idea of geographic vastness that informs both the United States from the Atlantic to the Pacific, from the Gulf of Mexico to the Bering Straits. Canada, bounded by three oceans, the Arctic on the north, the Pacific on the west, the Atlantic on the east. As well as vast geography, there are vast worlds depicted by these writers. There is, for example, the urban experience depicted by James Baldwin in The Rock Pile. There's the minimalist experience of Raymond Carver in stories such as Cathedral and the only non-immigrant American experience expressed in stories such as Leslie Marmon Silco's Coyote Holds a Full House in His Hand. There's also multicultural influences between these two countries. America has, of course, had a long experience with multiculturalism, but an immigration policy of, policy of Canada more recently has shifted immigration policies to welcome Asians, Caribbeans, Africans, as Canada begins to enter the world of contemporary multiculturalism. This world is well described in stories such as Margaret Atwood's Dancing Girls. And so it is that to handle the vastness of this experience, I want to go narrow, and I want to talk about the four stories I've just mentioned. That is. I want to have a look at James Baldwin's The Rock Pile, a tragedy, a dramatization of conflict between individual and the given. I want to look at Raymond Carver's Cathedral, a story of rebirth, a depiction of tentative salvation and epiphany. I want to look at Leslie Soko's Coyote Holds a Full House in His Hand, a comedy, a farce. And I want to look at Margaret Atwood's Dancing Girls, a story expressing the need for cheer, for good humor and a critical look at ourselves and what we're about. Let's start with James Baldwin, 1924 to 1987. Harold Bloom, Sterling Professor of Humanities at Yale, tells us that Baldwin is a minority of one, a solitary voice breaking forth against himself and all others from within himself. He is a Jeremiah, isn't he? A rhetorician, a man of his own rage, of his own anguish, a viewer of his own perplexities. We know him, of course, from his novels and essays. Go Tell It to the Mountain, Giovanni's Room, Another Country, Tell Me How Long the Train's Been Gone, If Beale Street Could Talk Just Above My Head, and Four Books of Essays, The Fire Next Time, Nobody Knows My Name, The Famous Notes of a Native Son, No Name in the Street, and two plays, Blues for Mr. Charlie and Amen Corner, and one book of short stories, Going to Meet the Man. Baldwin is, a, in a sense, a, a, a character uh, that embodies um, the American political experience of African Americans, a symbol himself of change, born in Harlem in 1924, the stepson of an evangelical minister. He was brought up in an atmosphere suffused with piety and with puritanical rigor. His stepfather, of course, stern, authoritarian, insisted that his children devote as much time as they could to his views of Christian teaching. His Christian order began to turn in favor of literature when he attended high school. The Rock Pile, a particular story that is of sort of autobiographical interest for students of Baldwin, is a story of a family, of Gabriel, the father, a man of deep religious conviction, who is protective toward Roy, the youngest son, but antagonistic toward John, nameless and a stranger living, unalterable testimony to his mother's days of sin, and of Elizabeth, the mother, protective of John and fearful of the smoldering rage of her husband, Gabriel, the father. It's a story of a child damage, but more by patriarchal religious values than by the criminality of the streets. Symbolically, of course, the rock pile itself is a world of the street, a world where Roy, the youngest son, is wounded by a stray rock thrown as he plays on a pile of natural rock jutting out of the ground between two houses. John is supposed to be watching his younger brother, but Roy slips out. The story, then, is a wait for judgment. 
What will Gabriel, the father, do, do when he finds his beloved child wounded? And there's the interior of the family. To the wounded Roy, Gabriel is gentle and comforting. To John, he's critical and caustic. Asked if he saw Roy slip downstairs, John is silent. Boy, do you hear me? The father rages. You want me to take a strap to you? It is in this hateful environment that Elizabeth and John submit. As the story ends, Elizabeth tells John to pick up his father's lunchbox. Baldwin writes, She heard behind her his scrambling movement as he left the easy chair, the scrape and jangle of the lunchbox as he picked it up, bending his dark head near the toe of his father's heavy shoe. This is a tale of oppression. John is caught between the world of the street and the world of his family. Ironically, the latter is more dangerous, the more damning. Baldwin, a Jeremiah, rages against the violence that threatens the children. In his book of essays, The Fire Next Time, Baldwin writes, When I was very young and was dealing with my buddies in those wine and urine-stained hallways, something in me wondered, what will happen to all that beauty? For black, black people, though, I am aware that some of us, black and white, do not know it yet, or very beautiful. He further writes, everything now we must assume is in our hands. We have no right to assume otherwise. If we, and now I mean the relatively conscious whites and relatively conscious black who, much like, who must, like lovers, insist on or create the consciousness of others, do not falter in our duty now, we may be able, handful that we are, to end the racial nightmare and to achieve our country and change the history of the world. If we do not dare everything, the fulfillment of that prophecy recreated from the Bible and song by slave is upon us. God gave Noah the rainbow sign, no more water, the fire next time. I'm reminded here, of course, of Baby Sugg's comment and Beloved, her, 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 her statement that we should love ourselves, we should love our bodies, love your heart, she tells her followers. As a young man, I remember seeing Baldwin speak at the University of Tennessee when I was a student there. Baldwin was small and very beautiful. In his opening words, he reminded his audience that, I remember when a black man couldn't walk the streets in Knoxville. Baldwin went on to describe a picture of his, really our tormented world. Later, when a member of the audience asked what we were to do in such a bleak world, Baldwin reeled back and roared forth in his best pulpit voice, sell all you have and give it to the poor. As a man of extremes and of righteous indignation, when he died in 1987, I mourned his loss, and I mourned the loss of Miles Davis as well, who could hit such a register on the horn because he was so very angry. Baldwin and Davis, authentic African-American voices. Raymond Carver, too, is part of this picture, 1938 to 1988. We have another working class world in Raymond Carver's works, a world that Carver himself knew well. A man born in Oregon in 1930, up growing up in Washington, he followed his father's work directly into the sawmill. By the, age, by the age of 20, he was married, and he had two children. In 1958, Raymond Carver moved his debt-ridden family to California. He worked at a series of low-paying jobs, including delivery man, gas station attendant, hospital janitor. His first break came with the editor of Esquire, Gordon Lish, who in 1971 published his, neighbor, his, his short story, Neighbors, and Carver had then broken into the slicks, national periodicals with large readerships in which he would soon become a picture. Awards followed, and <clears throat> Raymond Carver died far too young for most of us. His story, Cathedral, opens with the narrator explaining that following the death of his wife, a blind man is coming to stay at home. He has never known a blind man, he says in the movies. The blind moved slowly and never left. The unnamed narrator is hostile toward his wife's previous life from which Robert comes. And as in Baldwin, we find that men hate women for having lived lives before they came to possess them. Robert is not from the movies. The blind man is robust, Hemingway-like, so at ease with his host that he navigates his new surroundings, downs drinks, blows a joint. And then it happened. Dazed, the narrator and Robert are watching a television documentary that comes on about cathedrals. In an idiom characteristic of Carver's prose, the narrator is asked by Robert to describe what a cathedral looks like. Let's look to that passage. It's all right, bub, the blind man said. Hey, listen, I hope you don't mind me asking you. Can I ask you something? Let me just ask you a simple question, yes or no. 
I'm just curious, and there's no offense, you're my host, but let me ask if you were in any way religious, you don't mind me asking. I shook my head. He could see that. He couldn't see that, though. A wink is the same as a nod to a blind man. I guess I don't believe in it, in anything. Sometimes it's hard. You know what I'm saying? At Robert's suggestion, the narrator gets pen and paper. With Robert's hands rising on top of the narrators, they begin drawing a cathedral. As they draw, the narrator comes to something with Robert. It was like nothing else in my life up till now, the narrator confesses. It's really something. The British writer James Joyce coined the term epiphany, a sudden intuition presenting a moment of revelation, a moment of grace for such times. Ultimately, that's the point of the story. For these people, too, there are moments of grace. But what about resolution? What about the wife? In his autobiographical essay, Fires, Cogma writes, I hate tricks. At the first sign of a cheap trick or a gimmick in a piece of fiction, a cheap trick or even an elaborate trick, I tend to look for cover. And that is all we have here. A story of desolation, a story of emptiness, and a story of possible redemption. Leslie Mormon Soko was born in 1948, and she's best known for her novel Ceremony, a 1977 novel narrating the struggle of a half Laguna, half Anglo man to adjust to the culture of a New Mexico reservation. Soko's short story, Coyote, is that of a Laguna man on his way to a Hopi town. The narrator is named in the story, though the title, the narrator is unnamed rather in the story, though the title gives away his identity. He is the coyote, the trickster figure, the figure of traditional Native American folklore. A narrator is clearly a trickster, a middle-aged man too spoiled to marry. He is on his way to a seduction. He has corresponded with a Hopi woman, Mr. Sakaku, and goes to visit her, but the visit is not going well. There is opportunity, however, that emerges. An ant is ill with dizzy spells. Seizing the moment, he passes himself off as a medicine man. The cure? All the women of the village must line up to have their thighs rubbed with juniper ashes. Coyote sits slyly by the fireplace and works painstakingly with each one. The result? I feel better already, proclaims an ant. I'm not dizzy. And of course the women want to do something for him. Silco writes, he graciously declined any payment, but the women insisted they wanted to do something, so he unzipped his jacket pocket and brought out his little pocket camera and a flash cube. As many as they could stood with him in front of the fireplace, and some would snap the picture. By the time he left Aunt Mamie's house, he had two shopping bags full of pies and peaky bread. Are we offended by the tricks of sexual exploitation of these women? Is this a continuous game play by Laguna and Hopi men, a combat of sorts? Is this a tale of moral revenge because of the veiled seductions of Hopi women? Is Mrs. Kaku an innocent or duplicitous Desdemona? Is Coyote revenging Othello? The answer is yes to all of the above. This is the brilliance of Soko's comic myth. Margaret Atwood, the final author I want to talk about, is best known, of course, for her 1985 novel, The Acclaimed the Handmaid's, Ta the Handmaid's Tale. Atwood has received the claim for women's ways of looking at experience, for possessing an imagination that aims to construct experience as gendered. Her short story, Dancing Girls, is a Horatian, a gentle satire, as opposed to a juvenilian or a biting satire. Anne, the main character in here, is a graduate student living in student quarters at Mrs. Nolan's house, a place filled with a multitude of international students. As the story opened, Mrs. Nolan asks Anne to don her native costume. What would that be, Anne wonders? Perhaps a tailored skirt and a Shetland sweater? Or perhaps snowshoes and a parka? Anne's mind drifts to grammar school and a book, The Golden Windows Reader, with its verse, Little Indian, Sua Cree, Oh, don't you wish that you were me? The vision is obviously undesirable to Anne, as is Mrs. O'Nolan's, especially in her response to call the police when an Arab student throws a party. But what is Anne's own vision as a graduate student of urban design? Let's read from Dancing Girls. Groups of people were walking happily among trees, holding hands not just in twos, but in threes, fours, fives. The man from next door was there in his native costume. And the mathematicians, they were all in their native costumes. Beside the stream, a man was playing the flute. And around him, in long, flowered robes and mauve scuffies, the auburn hair floating around their healthy pink faces, smiling their Dutch smiles, the dancing girls were sedately dancing. It appears that Anne, too, was unable to realistically visualize people. The blend is sedate, 
It's pastoral. It's totally unrealistic. It is a multicultural world, all right. It is just that it does not correspond to reality. So what are we to make of these two continents as demonstrated in these four pieces we've examined? Well, maybe we're all like Anne in Dancing Girls. Maybe we're all urban planners who can never visualize people whose green spaces are always empty. And maybe this is the key to understanding something of the vision of contemporary North American writers. First, it may be that we believe it is what we believe is unusual is not unusual at all. Maybe for American writers, there's not a canon. There's no list of great works. Maybe there is no universal at all as we commonly understand it. Or if there is one, then maybe we had better look and look again at exactly what it is. The rise and the development of the novel, as it is much a part of Jane Austen's world, as it is a part of Henry Fielding's world, fiction has in fact always accommodated those who wish to find their place in society through imaginative writing. Maybe we would do better to look at the unusual more closely and find if, after all, it has not always been there. Two, these writers have the same message. It is a tough, hard world to love. All manner of threat is out there, family strife, dislocation, anxiety. The American dream clearly has an underside, these writers reveal, and it is not accommodating. And so what are we to do? Sell all you have and give it to the poor, as Baldwin said? Well, maybe the conclusion is that we should not all be asking for unrealistic things. Maybe, after all, the ability to endure is to be praised. And perhaps we should also be looking for the need for cheer. Sokol realizes that. Ed does, as does Atwood, Ed did Shakespeare. In The Tempest, Shakespeare's play about a 1609 scattered expedition to Plymouth in which a ship was lost, the news of the survival created a sensation. Shakespeare capitalized on it. At the end of this almost miraculous dream that is a play, Prospero, the lost and found Duke of Milan, speaks. He tells us, my ending is despair unless I be relived by prayer, which pierces so that it assaults mercy itself and frees all faults. As you from crimes would be pardoned, let your indulgence set me free. And that is the state of contemporary North America. We ask indulgence from despair, an indulgence that would be granted to others as we ourselves would have it granted. And it is that indulgence, of course, that lends itself to freedom. If there is no single universal vision in contemporary American writing, is that a bad thing? Something that should alarm us? Not at all, I would argue. After all, there never was a single American voice. It just seems so because so many voices were silenced. What we have today in the literature of North America, in a way for us to imagine, is that we have a reading of poets and dramatists and novelists and readers are invited to shape their perceptions about how each is and about how we are with each other. So instead of a singular vision, let's offer each other the image offered to us by Bell Hooks. Bell Hooks tells the story of her grandmother who spent a lifetime making quilts. Hooks writes, although she did not make story quilts, Baba believed that each quilt had its own narrative a story that began from the moment she considered making a particular quilt. The story was rooted in the quilt's history, why it was made, why a particular pattern was chosen. When given a choice of quilts, Hook selects one made of cotton dresses in a cool, deep pattern. Her grandmother could not understand why she chose that pieced fabric made of little stars from her mother's and her sister's cotton dresses over those more fancy quilts. Yet, Hooks writes, those bits and pieces of Mama's life held and contained them and remained precious to me. And the particular is the precious. In reading the literature of North America, it is our privilege to search through it and to find themes that are meaningful because they are rich in their power to explain, to heal, and to give cheer. The shape and texture of the quilt will be determined by you.